It's totally me, Jake Manning. Definitely, definitely not somebody different. I'm back uh, to do uh, part two of the Ultimate Warrior here today. All right, you say all those words, but are you really you, Jake? I don't know. I, I'm yeah. Uh, J- even though I got different eyes, uh, you know, you, you, like definitely, like, like I'm sure, like your mom would look at me like, oh, that person's got different eyes oh, than oh. the other Jake Manning. That's definitely mm. a different person. That's definitely not the original Jake Manning from part one. I know you're thinking of that, but that's, that's definitely yeah. not the case. I've definitely always been the same person. Oh, God, that's a lot of protesting and defense. I don't, it, yeah? You know, for, I know I got a different prove, haircut. Prove, I mean, you prove it. Tell me. uh, uh, I had matches uh, before um, with uh, people in uh <laughs> ring before. Um, but, sorry, I, I, as you can tell, I've lost so much weight, I, I, uh, so okay. I don't look the way I used to anymore. Yeah, your veins aren't like an earthworm trying to get out of the earth. And I got a different haircut, so you're probably thinking, ah, oh, that's a different Jake Manning, uh, uh, but it's bit. not. Def- definitely the same oh. Jake Manning. Okay, that's good to know. That's that was here know. for part one is here for part two. Okay, what? cool. How, how do you feel about tent? Oh, don't even get me started. Uh, all right, I mean, it's probably ki- Jake. I will it's... use all kinds of slurs on tent. <laughs> uh, this is probably Are Jake. Are there tent slurs? Oh, there's tent <laughs> slurs, and I'm going to use all of them in a blog, which I will eventually delete later on. <laughs> all right, all right. Welcome to Ten Bell Pod. This is Ultimate Warrior Part 2. I am Nick Alexander, and I am in Burbank, California. I bought weed with my debit card. And I am joined thousands of miles away in the Manning Cave with Micah J. Loving. I bought gas with my debit card, so fuck you. <laughs> and uh, also, what a man, what a man, what a mighty good man scout, <laughs> <laughs> Jake Manning. There's got to be an age demographic that'll get that. <laughs> Killing. Well, it's got to be this this group because we're talking about somebody <laughs> who was popular in the 80s and 90s. So I would assume that they would know about salt and pepper. Uh, and just to go with the theme, I bought a, a key with my debit card today because I broke the office key in the lock of Ooh. the office uh, yesterday. So I had to re make my office key today because I was so jacked and swole for part one. <laughs> but now now that I am now leaner and meaner on uh, part two, I needed to get a sturdier key that can get in there and turn properly. Did you go to one of those weird Walmart key maker things where you can just put your debit card in or what are we doing? I wish. I had to go to Home Depot and wait uh, for somebody to help me. So uh, when we left off part one, Warrior and Vince had just gotten a wee bit of a dispute about money and scheduling that led to Warrior leaving the company. However, by the start of 1993, Vince had bigger problems. Hulk Hogan was about to leave, so Vince needed Warrior back. They worked it all out, and at WrestleMania 8, Ultimate Warrior would make his comeback. Now, you say disagreement. I can just picture it just going, Vince going... Fuck the warrior. <laughs> and then bringing him back, I'm pretty sure it went, fuck it, call the warrior. <laughs> like At WrestleMania 8, a- after the match between Hulk Hogan and Psycho Sid, Hulk was attacked by Sid and Papa Shango. And running out to make the save was Ultimate Warrior to a thunderous pop. That's the story WWE wants you to believe. But in reality, Vince <laughs> had Jim Helwig murdered for holding him up for money, then cloned him with his DNA so that he could take the Warrior brand forward. And there's a lot of proof. First, Warrior's hair was shorter. Uh, He wrestled in a singlet, which the real Warrior would never do that. It's true. It's like to point out that uh, Kerry Von Erich and I don't know this dude, but his name popped up. Jeff Gaylord were the top suggestions for being the fake Warrior. Oh, you nope. show some fucking respect to Jeff Gaylord. <laughs> I don't right? think I showed any disrespect. <laughs> but I, I, I'll admit, I'll admit ignorance on him. Not disrespect, but ignorance. You don't know Jeff Gaylord? No, I know him. Oh. He's, he's, I mean, he was an okay, like, Memphis guy. Oh, just okay? Yeah. God, who's I, disrespecting now, Jake? What I'm just saying, <laughs> like, th- those are all plausible things. You look at these guys, they're like, oh, he could have just replaced them. Because Ultimate Warrior runs out, and he looks like 
Sam Houston running out, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. not the ultimate warrior. So I, I can't tell you how many friends of mine told me up and down that they had two ultimate warriors yeah. and they all, all of them said that their mom agreed with it. <laughs> their mom like saw like, it goes, Oh, if you look at the eyes, he had different eyes. So there's obviously two ultimate warriors. And one of the stories I heard is the ultimate warrior died. He was doing a bench press and like, he didn't have a spot and, and like he was bench pressing like 500 pounds and it came on him and it collapsed and it killed him. Oh, shit. So the real ultimate warrior died. So they had to get a different ultimate warrior. I can't tell you over the course of my life from grade school to college, <laughs> I heard all of the conspiracy theories of Ultimate Warrior being dead. And I even believed in myself. I can't tell you how many times that I told people, like, yeah, there's two Ultimate Warriors <laughs> and that Carrie Von Eric uh, was the second Ultimate Warrior. And I was even saying that Carrie was playing the Ultimate Warrior in WCW, which wouldn't fucking happen because Carrie was fucking dead at that time. <laughs> but then as I get older into more conspiracies, maybe he faked his death so he could play the Ultimate Warrior in WCW. <laughs> Higher. So, that's eighth level thinking, Jake. Eighth level thinking. You like got me. His teeth were different. I think maybe he got veneers or something. But his yeah, of course teeth. he's got the money. He's got time yeah. off. You know, you want to update all of your look, and there you go. And yeah, please Google Jeff Gaylord because when you look him up, you're like totally the fucking warrior. So at 1992 SummerSlam, Warrior would have a match which would end up being his last pay per view match for several years, where he would face. The Macho Man Randy Savage. Now, Jake, have you ever heard of someone losing a retirement match yet still competing later? Oh, Ric Flair. <laughs> um, just about everybody in professional. Terry Funk. Yeah. I mean, Hulk Hogan probably. I mean, you go down the list. The rule of thumb when you lose a retirement match, you got to give it about a year. No. Okay, you got to give it about a year. Unless you're in WCW, you get it four months. That's all you need. <laughs> I, all right. I'm going to go out on a limb and say this match is better than the WrestleMania 7 match. They're both close. Like, one's not a glaring winner, but this match is fantastic. See, what's weird is I, when I was doing research and I finally pulled this up, and I remember seeing shots because it's in, uh, was it uh, Wembley? I think yeah, it's yeah, Wembley. Yeah. And uh, just that outdoor stadium and seeing those shots of the Warrior and the colors they're wearing, it's that old 12 year old memory where you're like i don't remember this and yeah. so when i watched the match like a week ago it was the first time i'd ever seen randy versus warrior at SummerSlam, and it really is fucking dynamite i probably i'd probably prefer the the wrestlemania match but this one is so damn good too it shows again i mean warrior can be carried to a really good fucking match Meltzer gave it uh four stars and just the whole angle of uh what what corner is perfect going to be in? Is he going to be in Randy's corner? Is he going to be in Warrior's corner? And just no one comes out and Heenan's confused. It's that whole thing where Perfect and Flair finally come out. The crowd goes bonkers, but they don't reveal who they're with because they fuck with one of them first. And they're like, oh, he's on his side. And then they fuck with the other dude next. So it's like, oh, they both turned him down. And Perfect and Flair are just pitching a fit. I, I love the angle on that. It really added a shit ton to the drama. And Warrior will have another match where he piles on more than this one, but I marked out that it was Flair, Macho Man, Mr. Perfect, and Warrior all in like the same little segment. That's crazy. It's, it's, yeah, it, it was it was pretty exciting. And then the, just thinking about that crowd, it's like they got a Hart Davy Boy for that Intercontinental Championship match, which was fucking amazing right before that too. So they they I think the crowd is so amped because the Hart. Davy Boy match right before it just blew him out of the water. Well, that's what Bret Hart will tell you. Like, there's no way <laughs> yeah. we had such an amazing match that nobody could follow it, even with Flair <laughs> and Macho Man and and Ultimate Warrior. Nobody could compare to what me and Bulldog had put out there. Um, you've obviously been reading Bret Hart's book <laughs> recently. So uh, eventually, Macho Man dives to the outside to hit Ric Flair, but Rick is holding a chair and hits him with it. So Macho Man gets counted out, ending the match. Um, after the match, all hell breaks loose. Perfect and Flair try to break Macho Man's leg, and then Warrior breaks it up. Weird quick thought. When Savage is up on the top rope and he's debating coming off and hitting Warrior, it's one of those uh, indie spots this big now when the dude's on the top rope and he's looking to attack the dude in the ring 
and then he pulls that quick 180 and Savage all of a sudden is diving onto Flair. It was it was one of those spots that I didn't see coming and it, it felt way ahead of its time. In November 92, Warrior was scheduled to team up with Macho Man as the ultimate maniacs to face Ric Flair and Razor Ramon at Survivor Series. But weeks before the event, Warrior was again released. This was the steroid trial, and WWF was cracking down. However, I'm not going to sit here and let you two monsters say that Ultimate Warrior was doing steroids. There's a good story. I think I've mentioned him before, but... Username Crimson Mask on the Wrestling Me- Classics message board had a comment where Meltzer would refer to Helwig in the sh- in the sheets as the anabolic warrior. And apparently <laughs> in the office in Japan, just with the translation stuff, they thought it was his actual ring name. So in the actual bills for advertisements for Warrior in Japan, they billed him as the anabolic warrior. So again, Warrior was out of WWF. And between November of 92 and July of 95, Warrior was semi-retired from pro wrestling altogether, making a appearance on a handful of indie shows. And during this time away, he opened Warrior University. He also did an independent promotion in Las Vegas, National Wrestling Conference. And like the promos that he did and were just bonkers but they were so much money in this promotion like they would book the the most absurd matchups ever like they book like virgil was their top guy like that, that was their top baby face like they booked virgil versus terry funk jesus and then they they did like a hanging angle with jim neidhart and virgil and they booked like the powers of pain versus bob bradley and rob van Dam. What? Yeah, it was like, but it was like really fucking weird. But they booked the warrior for a couple shots, and they had him cut some promos, and they always had the promos on their TV episodes. And it's just one of those things where, like, I'm sure they contacted Warriors people. Warrior named some ridiculous number, and these guys were dumb enough to pay it. The weirdest trivia bit I found from doing research when Warrior got suspended on this part is Bret Hart said that Vince told him he was going to beat the Warrior in the middle of the ring with a sharpshooter at the 93 Royal Rumble if shit wouldn't have gone down. And I, I just the image of that seems like bullshit, but I don't know. Just the fantasy of it's pretty cool, too. Yeah, Bret Hart said that? <laughs> That's your only source on that? Then, yeah, that was definitely fiction. I threw that up, and you knocked the shit out of it. Because <laughs> um, I'm a Sean guy. <laughs> also, in between Warrior's time here, he did a... He talked about wanting to do movies, and he did one movie. You can look it up. It's called Firepower. PM Entertainment, who has made some of the best direct-to-video action movies out there. They really, they, they're they good shit. If anybody knows Gary Daniels, he was kind of a direct-to-video, Van Damme, Steven Skull. He was in it, and Steve McQueen's son, Chad McQueen. And Warrior plays the ultimate villain in this movie called The Swordsman. And I'm going to end on just reading the plot. You can find it. It's on YouTube in its entirety. In the near future, street gangs have their own zones called Hell Zones, where cops can't go. Two tough cops, Chad McQueen and Gary Daniels, undercover to investigate an illegal cure for AIDS. But first, (laughs) they must fight in a death match leading to a showdown with the Swordsman. And then it's basically like Bloodsport with a bunch of weapons in a cage. But it's... The, I read the IMDb plot summary, and I can already tell that I, I edited it, but I should have edited it more because it's a little choppy. But uh, yeah, it's it's quite the movie. Helwig has like the first three scenes, and he only says one line, so even then you could tell they were like, nah, don't let this dude fucking talk. <laughs> hold, the, hold the fucking phone. <laughs> wait, wait a goddamn minute. Yeah. Illegal cure yeah, for AIDS. I said illegal. See, the, 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 I should, they didn't point this out. It takes place in the future in 2007. But, like, if you have the cure for AIDS, I know, I know. who wor- gives a shit if it's fucking legal? The wording is very bad. I don't know if it's a fascist RoboCop type uh, angle to this stuff. Illegal cure for <laughs> fucking AIDS? That is the fucking dumbest shit I've ever fucking heard before in my entire life. You- That's so dumb, it's turned me into Jim Cornette, motherfucker. Like- <laughs> if you would like to see the, the dumbest fucking thing you've ever fucking seen. Go to IMDb and look up the plot summary for Firepower. There's the one I read, and then there's a longer one that's 
way too fucking long, but it gives more of the story. I hope it fucking clarifies the illegal <laughs> cure for AIDS. I think they point. talk about. I think they. I read it. They they say it's a a black market. So it's like if the FDA. But does it fucking work? Does it fucking work? <laughs> <laughs> That's the world we live in, Jake. How many cures for AIDS do you think really exist right now? One. Thousands? One, because Magic Johnson fucking has it. <laughs> oh, I mean, that's true. All right. By early 96, Vince and Warrior had again patched things up. So Warrior returned to WWF on March 31st at WrestleMania 12. After some OJ Simpson car chase footage, Warrior faced Hunter Hearst Helmsley, who was accompanied to the ring by Sable, making her WWF debut. So two awful careers were <laughs> launched and or relaunched because of this match. You know I'm a Sable apologist. I, I don't want to start another Sable rant on, th- on this p- particular podcast, Nicholas. I know I've just hit a nerve. <laughs> I thought you were setting up Nick for something because the way he ended that sentence is like he didn't want to say anything about Sable. And I'm like, who the fuck is Nick Alexander? No, he wanted to. He definitely <laughs> fucking wanted to. That's why I jumped in and uh, said what I yeah, said. I was like, yeah. right, I was teeing him up for another Sable rant on another episode, but he didn't go there. Nick, you got to live your gimmick. If you're not living your gimmick, then what are you doing? I'm going to edit in the old one. <laughs> Well, can you edit in my defense of your rant since you edited it out of the original one? <laughs> yeah, no, I'll edit in point. you going, yes, exactly. <laughs> that, okay. So Warrior came back to a huge pop, but his entrance is about twice as long as the actual match. And during this match, I thought the crowd reaction was super weird. Like, I think it was a mix of old school fans and newer fans because half the people were super pumped at everything Warrior did. And the other half seemed very like, all right, who's this guy? You know, Warrior takes a pedigree and beats Triple H back up to his feet. It was nuts. It was the craziest no sell I've ever seen. <laughs> um, I think his jacket protected him. because yeah, you know, it, <laughs> That's a good theory. <laughs> then it's some clotheslines, press slam, big splash, and Warrior squashes Triple H in about 100 seconds. I got to say, I was... Super jacked about this match. <laughs> Not going to fucking lie. You mean when you watched it live? Yeah. Yeah. I watched it fucking live. I, I remember vividly getting this pay-per-view because I wanted to see Shawn Michaels hold the WWF championship. Yeah, you were a big mark even back then. Huh? Goddamn right I was. <laughs> fucking right I was. But here's the, here's the funny part. I was got violently ill part of the way through that main event. So I missed the entire main event. Iron Man match with Brett and Sean. I was I was on the toilet like the rest of the <laughs> night. I ate something that did not agree with me, and or maybe the reaction to this match, <laughs> uh-huh. like it made me sick. But here's the thing that's even worse about that is my house only had two TVs in it for five people, and I was basically taking over the living room to watch this pay per view, and they're gonna let me watch this pay per view, and I'm recording it so I could keep it and watch it again. But the thing is, though, I'm not in front of the TV, so the the living room was just empty playing WrestleMania 12 while I'm in the bathroom, and everyone in my family, all four members of my family, are crammed in my parents' bedroom to watch the other (laughs) TV because they didn't want anything to do with wrestling. Did you at least, like, crank the volume real loud so you could sit on the toilet? Yeah, so I could hear (laughs) when it got close to the end just because, like, and here's another thing, too, that I fucking hate when I see title matches on the independent scene is when like the heel or or even a sense like a baby face will like have a skirmish with the, the heel champion and he, and he picks up the belt and holds it. Mm. And also like the heel when he grabs the belt and holds it up. I hate that because I paid $40 for WrestleMania just to see Shawn Michaels hold that belt cuz I I wanted to know what that image and what that picture looked like. And and that's why I paid the money for that and that's why I crawled from the fucking bathroom <laughs> to look around the corner as I'm like shitting my pants just to fucking see Shawn Michaels hold that belt and tell Bret Hart to get the fuck out of his ring. So, I'll clean it up, mom. I'll clean it up. Yeah. But the, the promo videos leading into WrestleMania 12, like they showed all the classic footage, which was like very nostalgic, even for me at, at 13. <laughs> like, like I was like, Oh, I remember seeing this. I remember the warrior being kind of cool. Like, Holy shit. Like, Hulk Hogan's on the other channel and it's kind of lame over there, <laughs> but fucking Warriors coming back to WWF. Fuck yeah. Like I was super fucking excited. This was like very early, like download music day. Like I found a download, like a shitty fucking download version of the Warriors music and I'd listen to it in the gym. <laughs> like I was like so goddamn fucking pumped for the Warrior coming back and I saw this match. I'm like, fuck yeah, Warriors back. And then like 
it was all fucking downhill from there. <laughs> yep. So, and the the good tag on this is basically Warrior came in and changed the entire book into the match. And even in a shoot interview, Warrior takes a small amount of credit for Hunter's success now because of the way that Warrior came in and kind of took over the booking of this match. So Hunter learned. The attitude that Warrior showed in that match to get what he wanted today. Which is funny that you say that. I remember Hunter doing an interview about this match, and he said, that guy was the most un- unprofessional person <laughs> I've ever been in the ring with before my entire life. That's the that's the tail side of the coin. Yeah. <laughs> so eight days after WrestleMania 12, Warrior made his Monday Night Raw debut on April 8th. He cuts an in-ring promo, I believe about doing DMT, before getting interrupted by Intercontinental Champion Goldust. Warrior then said, shit and ass, and I, for one, was fucking horrified at the language. Then he hit Goldust uh, to set up their match at In Your House 7, Good Friends, Better Enemies. Goldust comes in, does his movie references at this point, which I kind of want to list now of all his movie references, but Goldust references how he would kiss the warrior and all this stuff. And that's when warrior hits him with the bleeps that Nick is talking about. So I think it's kind of in there getting embarrassed. And just to go back to my opening thing about uh, George Reeves, gold dust calls him Superman from a comic books in this promo. So there, that again is reincarnation is real. And George Reeves is living in the ultimate warrior. So at In Your House 7, Gold Dust came out to the ring with not just Marlena, but also a bodyguard who was Mantar in Mafia Close. Uh, oh, was it? I yeah, think. it was. So for this match, how would you go about describing what the fuck happened here? Based on Jake's face, I think. He oh, I, 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 haven't watched it. <laughs> I haven't watched this since I saw it live. Um, like, sat, like, the Ultimate Warrior, who is supposed to be a picture of health, sat in a movie director chair and smoked a cigar. <laughs> Wait, can I, I want to jump in once. Uh, when he starts first puffing it, Vince chimes in. To my knowledge, the Ultimate Warrior does not smoke. Because you know immediately in his head, he's like, this is the baby face I'm pushing. Yeah. Is he fucking smoking? <laughs> yeah, and we all know Vince hates people that smoke. Yeah. And yeah, this is, like, I felt that same way too. Like, why are you smoking? <laughs> what, are you what, 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 are you, what are you doing? And... He sat in the chair, and then he invited Goldust to sit in the chair, and then he clotheslined Goldust out of the chair. The key, my, I'm reciting this all from fucking memory. Yeah, no, I well, you're nailing it. I, <laughs> I, it, is, it is fucking burned in my fucking head forever how fucking bad this match is. I, I've only seen this match once in my entire life, and it was happening live, and it is still <laughs> befuddling to this day. And knowing what I know Warrior now, I guarantee he said the F word agate uh, probably somewhere in the middle of this match. But you know why he said it? Because he joined in on the crowd chant that I'm pretty sure fucking happened. Exactly, yeah. yeah. When I was listening to it, it was one of those things like, this is on the network and I'm hearing it. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm I'm pretty sure he said that and just, just this match is, is befuddling. It made no sense. I, I was just like, this is this is not the ultimate warrior that I want to see. It's an angle. It's not a match. It's yeah, like a, it's a segment. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it, that's what it felt like. I felt and like Dustin is an amazing fucking wrestler, and if given an opportunity to have a match and a properly motivated Jim Helwig, he could have a great fucking match with him. But we didn't fucking get that at all. <laughs> no. And then what? It gold dust. Just runs off for the count-out loss, and that's it. About a month later, on a May 27th episode of Raw, Warrior and Gold Dust had a rematch as part of the King of the Ring preliminary rounds. They actually did a, a fucking real wrestling match. Uh, it ends in a double count-out, eliminating both men from the tournament. However, during this match, on commentary, they pretty much the entire time plugged the Ultimate Warriors comic book. What I want to do right now is, Jake, for you to describe what I'm doing. You're reaching and getting the Ultimate Warrior comic, uh, which is a picture of over-exaggerated drawing of the Warrior's face. <laughs> uh, obviously, Warrior font at the top. And you are pointing at a price tag, which is $15, which is way too much fucking money. <laughs> I could have got you one for free uh, because I have 
hundreds, maybe thousands of them sitting in the office currently. Do you have two, three, four? Yep. And the yep. ho- ho- all of them. Oh, shit. Okay, I really yep. want to read them because we're about to get into it. I paid uh, $9.99 plus $3 shipping, so basically $15 on that. Why I didn't reach out to you shows how dumb I am. Also, too, if you want the Nash comic book, I have that as well. I didn't know that existed. Yeah, it, it exists. The first page of Ultimate Warriors comic book is the very first page. A full fucking esoteric essay of true gobbledygook that reads like a college dropout's attempt at James Joyce's The Finnegan's Wake. Which, if you don't know what that is, I'm not trying to sound like a dick, but it's one of the most difficult fucking books ever. Warrior basically attempted that, and remember, he has no literary talent. All right, so this is something we got to get into because this is why you all came here for Destrucity. This is a definition that Warrior puts in the opening of the comic book. Trifold in its definition. Therefore meaning, the name of the galaxy and Warrior wherein the terrain of Testament lies. Two, the living of one's life in a way of a Warrior according to a Warrior's eight disciplines. Those are as follows. Physical. Beliefs. Moment of mastery, attitude, commitment, association, integrity, wisdom. Three, keep in mind this is the third definition of the fucking word that he just invented. The creating of a truce between one's destiny and one's reality, promising to stay true to what one is destined to be, yet accepting what is the now. Ellipses. One's reality. All right. There's also an, there's an entire essay on top of that. That your mind is already a scrambled fucking egg. The first issue feels like a self-help seminar attended by eight people at a Holiday Inn conference hosted by L. Ron Hubbard's third cousin who just did as much coke as he did Angel Dust. So what you're saying is that it's super good. (laughs) Yes. So we did mention that Warrior was knocked out of the King of the Ring qualifying. However, he would wrestle at 96 King of the Ring, locking up with Jerry the King Lawler. And before this match, Jerry comes out and roasts the fuck out of this crowd. He was he was doing good. He was, he, he was on fire. Because um, he knew everything was downhill once he got in the ring and started <laughs> wrestling. Well, you can talk about your Psalms. You can talk about your John 316. Ultimate Warrior 316 just whipped Jerry Lawler's ass in this match. Pretty short. Basically a squash match. Just days later, Warrior would be out of the WWF again so this story kind of goes uh warrior's father had died and he wanted to take some time off to grieve vince was like no you don't even know or like your dad you can't just bell on the company but warrior disagreed and he left so once again warrior left wwf on bad terms well also too like not only did the gold dust angle come off like shit and obviously the hunter uh, said he's the most unprofessional guy ever. There was also the whole debacle with the Lawler angle, too, where he came out wearing a baseball cap to protect his head from taking, <laughs> like, that picture with the glass and just, like, everything that they told him, like, hey, do this, he did the opposite. And he just did his own thing. And just back to, you know, like, if you weren't being such a shit bag, yep. we probably would have bought this. But, like, you know, the way we, we just presented it made it sound like, he came up and said, hey, Vince, my, my father passed away. I want to go see him. But uh, from what I always heard, like before leading up to that, he was asking for time off, asking for time off. And then all of a sudden after like getting rejected a couple of times, then he's like, well, my father passed away. So it's like, no, I know what this is. <laughs> so He went to the well too, one too many times. Yeah. So it wasn't until two years later that we'd see Ultimate Warrior when in 1998 he signed with WCW. And if you thought his 96 WWF comeback was bad, I raise you World Championship Wrestling. August 17th, 1998, on Monday Nitro, Hogan is out cutting his second promo of the night when he says there's not a warrior he couldn't beat to get his belt back. Then the lights flicker, then cut off, and in walks Ultimate Warrior and out walks the Renegade's career. This moment, I mean, fuck, man. It was so captivating. It was one of those truly surreal moments that I didn't think was happening. And the war, the way Warrior kind of, you know, was shooting on the old WWF matches and how Hogan hadn't beat him. And 
I mean, this, this fucking promo blew me away. And rewatching it, it was still, it was, it had me, man. It had me. Oh, it's intriguing, yeah. for 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 sure. But it wasn't intriguing enough for me when I remember watching it live. Like he just kept going on and on and on and on, and like he had some good points. But then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, you made those good points, and he's still talking. I'm like, oh, let's see what's on wrong. <laughs> Like, really? I was in the whole fucking No, way. I flipped back and forth on this one. Damn, do you remember what was on the other thing, though? I don't at yeah. all. <laughs> it, it, but it was like one of those things where like, oh, geez, he's still fucking talking? <laughs> are you going to gonna do anything? Okay, you're not going to do anything? You're just going to, I mean, are you going to talk about it? Or are you gonna, guys going to fuck? You know what I'm saying? It's kind of <laughs> one of those things. It's just like. I totally give you that, but it was, I don't, I think the power it's one of those things where somebody has you so good, it doesn't matter what they do. I mean, he had me for the first minute or so. And yeah. then two minutes and then five minutes. And I was like, this motherfucker's still talking. <laughs> I think this segment went like 17 minutes or something like that. It was it was like it, it was super like fucking. But it, he, he like, it was that stuff when you're that age, you're like, yeah, fuck yeah, get him. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I, I totally get it. But I remember being, that's, that's up there for me for just like, is this really fucking happening wrestling moment in my life? Warrior would face off against Hulk Hogan at Fall Brawl, September 13th, 1998, as part of a War Games match between WCW, NWO Black and White, and NWO Wolfpack. And the teams for this match, they're fucking nuts. It's like nine Hall of Famers. NWO Hollywood was Hogan, Bret Hart, and Stevie Ray. NWO Wolfpack was Nash, Sting, and Lex Luger. WCW was Warrior, Piper, and Diamond Dallas Page. That's like not a bad top 10 all-time list. I've seen worse. We also have to point out that stipulations for this match were so fucking dumb. Yeah, what the fuck? (laughs) It was a team war games match, like always. But for some reason, it was also every man for themselves. And also, (laughs) you could end the match at any point by pinning your man. Yes, and because they had, I think this was the first war games where they had a referee in the cage. Yeah, they had two in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but didn't make a difference. Didn't like Warrior break through the fucking cage? No, like... he, no, uh, he he did after he used the smoke bullshit. Or he ripped off his coat and then and then he runs from the back. It's like a Tony Clifton, Andy Kaufman fucking moment. And then he gets in the cage and then he kicks through the cage. What you're talking about yeah. and chases Hogan out of it. And then DDP hits a fucking diamond cutter on stevie ray or some fucking stupid shit yeah he he kicks through the cage even though they literally just set up that he can transport through the cage with fucking <laughs> smoke and but point it's the whole thing's just a clusterfuck and it that could have been one made. of the great matches ever <laughs> it's very dumb so from here they'd build to one of the biggest rematches of all time hogan warrior two as part of the build-up to this match that would take place at 98's Halloween Havoc, Warrior was in Hogan's mirror, I guess. Uh, he kidnapped the Disciple and then turned him on Hogan and cut way too many promos. Don't give Ultimate Warrior a mic. Warrior's next actual match would be part of the build-up October 12, 1998 on Nitro. And on this Nitro, he teamed up with Sting, so kind of full circle. Even though Michael Buffer said it was the first time they ever teamed up, Michael Buffer is a liar and not half the poker player that Bruce is. <laughs> so the Blade Runners faced Hogan and Bret Hart, and poor Sting had to put together a match with these three whiny-ass egos. God bless him. It gave me a flashback to WCCW whenever the Warrior was involved in a tag match. Whoever yeah. he was tagging with would be in the match for the first five minutes of the entire match. And then Warrior would go in to do a bear hug or some shit. But I was watching this match, and Sting went in there for the first good bit, and I was like, man, the more things change, the more they stay the same. He didn't even take off his ring jacket. Uh, He gives Brett three clotheslines, and then the match ends when NWO rushes the ring to save Hogan from Warrior. Which was basically 95% of every Nitro at the time. Yeah, it was. This led to Warrior's final WCW match and Warrior's final mainstream wrestling match, the infamous 1998 Halloween Havoc, which is one of the worst matches of all time. You know, I rewatched it, and it is bad, but it wasn't like... I can't say it was one of the worst of all time. The fireballs and abortion, they fucked that up. Yeah. And they're just kind of plopping around, but I'm going to dispute worst of all time, Nick. 
I, I will say that the announcers did a good job covering for the fireball thing because they kind of were like the audacity <laughs> of him even trying that. I thought it was like a quality save. No, I, I, I agree with you 100% because you can see them following the leader on the calls. Yeah. They're like, he, he tried to burn him. Yeah, he did try to burn him, didn't he? You're right. He did try to burn him. This match ends when Horse Hogan comes in with a chair to get some revenge on Hulk Hogan for injuring him earlier. But swerve, bro. He hits Warrior and Hogan gets the pin. Warrior's last appearance in WCW was on November 9th, 1998 episode of Nitro, where he came to the rescue of the Disciple who was being attacked by the NWO. Warrior would retire from professional wrestling a little later that year. So Hogan got his revenge, but it wasn't a clean revenge. And I'm kind of surprised that he didn't push for a clean revenge. Like he beat me once. I want to beat him, but it can't, you know, it has to be clean or it doesn't matter if it's a screw job or. Well, I mean, it makes more sense if it's a clean victory or, or some sort of screwy thing, but he still gets the clean pin. And then you build to the third match, which you now do at WCW, <laughs> where you have a better cut of the pay-per-view and the merch money and all sorts of things. As opposed to at the will of whatever Vince is giving you back in 88. So, makes more sense to get that rubber match, that final one. But yeah, yeah, fuck, yeah, okay. To do it there. All right, uh, Nick, I want you to respond to this because this is all of the moments where the Ultimate Warrior buried Hulk Hogan on his shoot interview. Okay, ready? All right. Warrior doesn't like that Hogan smoked, quote, dope. A day without dope is like a day without sunshine, brother. Um, Warrior accuses Hogan... And his wife, of uh, they were both whores doing slutty stuff on the side. And then Warrior says that he bets he was the only guy to n- say no to doing Hogan's wife. Uh, these are direct quotes. Hulkamania and negativity go together like peanut butter and jelly because for as good as a fucking writer as he is, he can't come up with a simile past a fucking third grade education. Hulkamania is a drain on society. America is sick of men like you, Tiger Woods, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Hulk Hogan. And this is Warrior's closing thoughts on Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan's life has been a whole work. Nick, your response? I I would say Ultimate Warrior sounds like a square who doesn't like to party. (laughs) Fair enough. So Warrior retired, and when most wrestlers retire, maybe they open up a body shop Maybe they get involved behind the scenes. But from here, Warrior would start a career as an incredibly bigoted public speaker, mostly speaking out against the LGBT community. Now, I know people have different opinions about things, but to use your fame and your outreach to hurt people who at the time had literal legislation against their happiness, to me, is unforgivable. Uh, WWE is now for profit embracing some progressive values, yet they do the Warrior Courage Award, or whatever the fuck it's called, named after a man who, if he hadn't already had a heart attack, would have a heart attack if he turned on the network and saw Velveteen Dream. And (laughs) that super pisses me off to name such a positive award after someone who had nothing but hate in his heart for people. I mean, Warrior's whole shit was be the person you are and don't be stopped by anything that tries to stop you, blah, blah, blah. And then he's spouting, querying doesn't make the world work. So he basically shit all over Katrina victims, basically saying, hey, it was the big deal. If they uh, would have lived their lives better and took control of their lives, this wouldn't have happened to them. And was the city really so great? Ah, they're too busy buying phones and two hundred dollar Nikes to live somewhere worth a shit. Oh, he's one of those guys. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah I, I, yeah. I'm aware of those guys, and those guys are the worst human beings oh, yeah. of all time. He's Good. The, he's the motherfucker that read Ayn Rand and did a bunch of blow, and thought he knew what the fucking world was. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, he has a problem with Martin Luther King having a national holiday, but not specifically George Washington, because. Uh, let's see. What what did uh, Martin Luther King do? It's only about 40 miles, and he walked on long paved roads and security escorts and modern comforts and conveniences. And, like, he led his best rally, and he's a plagiarist. And, I mean, it was it was this shit. It's just like, oh, you're this piece of shit. Yeah. So, I won't get into all that. But, uh, 
I, this this I mean this is coming back on me, but there's a good Vice article. Hey Vice, I don't totally hate you, but it's basically quotes from his blog in 2005, 2006. There's other articles that uh, quote all these blog posts. It's beyond fucked up. I won't read it all because it is fucked up. But he basically speaks out about how he's not a homophobe while just throwing gay slurs everywhere and acting like the angriest motherfucker at the party that no one's paying attention to. (laughs) Or he didn't feel bad that Heath Ledger died because at least his son wouldn't have to grow up with the negative influence of a man who was in a queer movie. Brokeback Mountain. And he has all types of hilarious Brokeback Mountain jokes about bend over Brokeback. I mean, it's like, it's the hackiest fucking Fox News shit ever. Here you go, Nick. He calls Bobby Heenan a two-faced bag of shit. He was glad that fucking Bobby Heenan got throat cancer, and he called it karma. Uh, oh, this is my favorite This is my favorite line in hypocrisy. He, he, he says about Triple H, You train like a twat and rely mostly on your sports supplements, which for him... With the steroids is hilarious. Um, he made fun of 9-11 firefighters because he said he could have done a different job. It's like Jesus. it all checks out with the type of bullshit that these type of guys think. And it's just sad. As, as much as I love this dude, for him to turn into this guy. Oh, no, I've never loved him. So like, uh, I mean, Yeah, uh, you got off easy, <laughs> goddammit. <laughs> I mean, I was excited to fucking see him as a wrestler, but as soon as I found out he was this type of individual, uh, I was out. So all that shitty stuff aside, Jake Manning... And Nick Alexander, are you ready to play? Who said it? Charlie Sheen or the Ultimate Warrior or slain Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi? (laughs) All right. (laughs) I got a shirt out of Jake. I'm happy. All right. I actually have some money, and I will pay the winner $5. All right. This is the first quote. You base. I'm going to say the quote, and then you have to pick Charlie Sheen, Ultimate Warrior, or Muammar Gaddafi. Gotcha? Okay. All right. I have defeated this earthworm with my words. Imagine what I have done with my fire-breathing fists. Sheen. I'm going to say Sheen as well. You are both correct. Well well done. I, I remember. I legit done. remember that quote. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds familiar. Life without dignity is worthless. Gaddafi. I'll go warrior. Nick is correct. Sorry, fuck. I, sorry. Oh, I, you I, slow rolled me, you fuck. <laughs> I slow rolled the shit out of you. Jake is correct. <laughs> Swerve, bro. Swerve. <laughs> What you mean is that you know you will never become famous, but in your dreams, when you fantasize that you might one day, you would want to have the confidence and belief in the staying power and value of your product like I do mine. Warrior. Yeah, I'm going to go warrior too because that sentence was so goddamn long. That's You are both correct. These resentments, they are the rocket fuel that lives up in the tip of my saber. Gaddafi. Warrior. I like that because the rocket fuel, but it's actually Charlie, Sh- Charlie Sheen. Ah, fuck. Ooh. I'm going to hang on to them, and they're going to fuel my attack. And they're going to fuel the battle cry of my deadly and dangerous and secret and silent soldiers. Because they're all around you. I must say warrior. Gaddafi again. Charlie Sheen. God uh. damn it. <laughs> your face will melt off, and your children will weep over your exploded body. Gaddafi? Warrior. Charlie Sheen. Fuck. <laughs> And Nick has to get so, get this one right, or Jake wins one to nothing. The U.S. Commission report on 9-11 was an absolute fairy tale, a complete work of fiction. Sheen. Warrior. It's Charlie Sheen. We have a tie. <sighs> um, this is it. All the marbles point. right here. All right. Then nobody can complain if we ask pregnant women to make parachute jumps. It's warrior. feel like it's warrior, but it also I feel like you've been swerving us a little bit. We've been off base, so I'm going to go with Gaddafi. Yeah! Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> that was amazing. I was in such suspense, and that was amazing. Yep. Parachute jumps, Libyan dictator, military escapades. Jake fucking nailed it. All right. I'm going to give uh, Jake $5. I'm not going to do it right now, but I will give him $5. All right. All right. So uh, that leads to 2005 when WWE dropped their diss track on Warrior The Self Destruction of the Ultimate Warrior. I actually was working for highspots.com at the time that this DVD came out. And I don't know if you guys recognize or remember the time when those WWE DVD releases came out and how big they were business wise. I was just like each one was an event. Uh the right. Rick the Rick Flair DVD for the longest time was held the record for 
like the most sales on highspots.com. Damn. Like for the longest time that Ric Flair DVD held the record as the the most popular item that the website had ever had. And in that moment in time, it had been around for 10 years. Jesus Christ. So like, or, or close to just shy of 10 years. So like was, th- those DVDs were very popular. And I remember coming in, like I think one of my first weeks was the, the Road Warrior DVD and then the Ultimate Warrior one came out. So I remember, you know, pulling a lot of or- orders for the Ultimate Warrior one. And of course, what was wonderful about working at highspots.com, you give Michael 20 bucks, you get to take it home before <laughs> everybody else gets yeah. their packages and you get to see it that night. And I remember seeing like the self-destruction of the Ultimate Warrior one and just you're like, Whoa. <laughs> being being the kid that was super excited by seeing the older footage of him and being excited to see him in WrestleMania 12 and then now seeing like scorching the earth on him was just like, wow. And then like when they talked about the the WrestleMania match and also kind of like the, the little tweaks to history that the WWE was able to do talking about how like after the WrestleMania match with Hulk Hogan and Hulk Hogan saying, you know, when I was being carted off, I knew we were in trouble when everybody was looking at me when I left, which give Hulk Hogan a, a way to turn a narrative around that somebody was less popular than him. He'll do it. And, and just, how the little tweaks of history of saying that he was never over, he wasn't worth anything and just all these little tweaks to the narrative. And I remember something that was very telling um, because Bret Hart ended up doing a DVD, I believe like the next year with WWE and keep in mind, Bret relationship with WWE was still even on the outs in 2005. It was, it was touchy at best. Like he would, you know, write a couple things in an article every once in a while and, WWE would kind of gloss over some stuff that Brett did, but they they were never like combative. And then when Brett got brought in to like, you know, maybe talk a little bit, maybe possibly doing a DVD, they were like, hey, um, this is kind of what we have right now. And as Brett described it, he said it was a very self-destruction of the Ultimate Warrior-esque DVD. And that's when Brett realized, oh, fuck, if I don't sign off and participate with a DVD about me and help them out and mend these fences, this is what they're going to do to my legacy. Which thinking, thinking, but at the same time too, you think how smart that is knowing what Bret Hart's one weakness is, his legacy is Mm in his titles, his memory with the wrestling fans. And then, you know, basically setting up like, Hey, this is what we could fucking do to you and manipulate him into getting him to play along with what you want. And his, DVD set was incredible. It's a three disc set and it's a, it's an amazing one. Too. And, yeah, and he, he gave a hundred percent and then that opened a door for more stuff in the future. That was pro Bret Hart. But uh, you could have almost had two hit jobs with these DVDs. So they were, they were very smart and they were very po- uh, powerful. So as powerful as the WWE network is now, that's how powerful these DVD sets were. One of the weird things that Jake is talking about, there's a spot in the self-destruction where they show a poster and it's the ultimate warrior versus the challenger Vader. And it's like the July 96 attitude adjustment tour. And the dude of history of WWE site who Graham Cathone, Cathon, I don't know. Sorry. Whatever your name is, dude. Thank you so much. But he basically pointed out that they basically uh, did a Photoshop of a Shawn Michaels post, but they don't understand why it was basically to show how warrior had all these bigger, possibilities and he still fucked it up which he did but it was them fucking with the history to make it look even worse so in 2007 warrior actually sued vince and wwf over the dvd a lawsuit that was ultimately dropped by both sides fast forward to february of 2013 warrior announced on his youtube channel that he was in talks with vince mcmahon and it seemed like things were getting patched up you know you brought up brett you brought up even hogan and it seems like no matter how bad things got with vince there's always like a door open to come back so it's like a weird thing like vince as much as people will criticize him i think he has a a soft spot for anybody that got in his ring performed every night put their body on the line went out there and performed for the fans and help build this empire that's now worth billions. I think he he has a soft spot for people. I, I think there, I think there's some humanity 
in this maniac psychopath Vince McMahon somewhere. You were you were there when uh, I was this, and just remembering that some way somehow, like like I think he has a softer spot for the guys that were with him during the '80s and '90s, and remember it when it was a much smaller company. I think he has much more of a softer spot for those people as opposed to the people that were there in 2009 uh, that would probably have the bigger issues because they had to take the bigger bumps and the longer road trips and were you know on a lot more prescription pills and probably need the most help and probably need a softer place in his heart than some of the guys in the 80s and 90s. So that leaves the last few days of Ultimate Warrior's life. And it's one of the most bizarre deaths because yeah. Ultimate Warrior still looked fantastic. Like he could have stepped in the ring and no one would have batted an eye. Actually, he stepped in the ring in 2008 and wrestled a match in Barcelona, Spain. And he looked in fucking incredible. He went over 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, and he, and he, well, he was blown up for most of it, as Orlando <laughs> Jordan will tell you. He, he, got still, he still did over 20 minutes. Yeah, uh, but uh, big ups for, big props to Orlando Jordan for carrying a blown up Ultimate <laughs> Warrior <laughs> in 2008. Yeah. I believe that like, footage is on YouTube somewhere. As Chris Masters said, it was uh, it's a 16-minute match. That was 20 minutes too long. <laughs> <laughs> so on April 5th, 2014, the Ultimate Warrior was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. He was inducted by Linda McMahon, who apparently he's always had a great relationship with. And for someone who sucked at promos, his speech was honestly amazing. It, w- it was funny. He pushed some boundaries on some things WWE clearly would not want him to say. He alluded to the DVD. Uh, it was honest. It was inspirational in parts. And he didn't even do any gay bashing. April 6th, Warrior appeared at WrestleMania 30. Backstage before the show, Warrior actually had a chance run in with Hulk Hogan, where Hulk walked up to Warrior and he apologized for everything that happened between them. Uh, Warrior accepted the apology and to me, it was like two older, wiser men squashing some petty shit from their 20s and 30s. Then the following night, April 7th, Warrior delivered a promo on Monday Night Raw. Warrior gave a speech to the fans and the wrestlers wearing an Ultimate Warrior mask. In that speech, he said, every man's heart beats its final beat. His lungs take their final breath. That is kind of spooky. It was a Weekend of amends and healing and closure for Warrior. And the last thing Warrior said to a camera before getting into his limo to leave WWE for the day was, it's great to be back home. I'm looking forward to the future. Then on April 8th, 2014, seemingly out of absolutely nowhere, Warrior died of a heart attack in Scottsdale, Arizona. According to reports... Warrior clutched his chest. He collapsed around 5.50 p.m. while walking to his car with his wife outside of his hotel in Arizona. He was rushed to the hospital where he was pronounced dead at the age of 54. So, final thoughts on The Ultimate Warrior. You know, we've, we've discussed people on here that are probably not the best human beings. Call back to the Vader episode where I list an indictment upon a human being because there was just no redeeming quality whatsoever. But it's fascinating episodes like this. Like I was excited for the, to see the ultimate warrior come back for WrestleMania 12. I enjoyed him when I was a kid. Obviously I was a Hogan guy, but I still enjoyed the ultimate warrior um, immensely as a child. I got excited about him being in WCW But as I got older and started hearing the stories and even like seeing a lot of the destruction of the Ultimate Warrior. But before I saw that DVD, I'd already heard a lot of the stories about Warrior, but then also to a lot of the hateful stuff towards people that just want to live their life and love the loves of their lives and not be hated for it. And that just fucking turned me off immediately from that man. And there was no coming back from that. Because he never, never, I don't know if he ever really apologized for any of that. He just moved past it like, oh, that was the thing that I fucking said. Whatever. I guess I'll take it down just so I can keep keep continue doing business. And seeing like the WWE, you know, sweep that underneath the rug. And then having somebody like Bailey come out, dresses the ultimate warrior, 
one time and it's just like, what the fuck, guys? Do you not realize how much of a fucking shitbag this guy was? We don't have to fucking, like, wipe him from the history of the Earth. But, like, let's let's not, like, canonize this person who is not a good fucking person. I mean, allow him to exist in history. Allow him to exist in the context that he existed in and just leave it the fuck be. But then there's those moments, like I mentioned in part one, where when he won the belt, he he cried because he understood the gravity of the situation. And I was actually on a wrestling show with the Ultimate Warrior one time for Northeast Wrestling. They brought him in for an appearance, and he had a line around the entire Mid-Hudson Civic Center. And uh, when he came in, he was wearing boat shoes, which was weird because <laughs> that was like the running joke all day long. Like, because we're getting in line to meet Boat Shoe Wario, you know, like, uh, but he had, the, he had the face paint on and he had the jacket on. So that way the pictures look good, which is more than what I can say for fucking Sting. You know, people talk about Sting being a great fucking guy, but if you meet fucking Sting, you have to pay him extra to do the face paint and put the jacket on. Like most of the time. He just has sunglasses on and then he has Purell next to him so he could sanitize his fucking hands. <laughs> so people talk about Sting being like the better person of that fucking tag team. But like Warrior showed up. It was engaging to every fan that came through. Actually, the meet and greet lasted longer because he was spending more time with the fans than they allotted. And that was one of the things that like they were trying to move people through as fast as possible. And he's like, no, let me interact with these fans. And then part of the deal was for him to show up on the show, like the actual live show, and like, you know, get on the live microphone and say whatever he wanted to say before the wrestling started started that night. The the match after his promo was uh, a ladder match and Caleb Connolly was in it. And Warrior, you know, saw these guys right by the entranceway getting ready for the match and going over stuff and then Warrior just kinda walked over and just kind of politely said, uh, guys, do you mind if I say something? And everybody's like yeah, sure. Uh, and he proceeded to talk about how all of these guys in this match were like the future of professional wrestling and he, like all your sacrifices. I hope they benefit you someday down the road in some universe far away and a stars that are connected. Like it kind of just did like it's warrior thing that was trying to be nice and engaging and, and make a lot of these younger guys, you know, feel like a million bucks and feel like a superstar. And then he, you know, went out there and cut this promo and, you know, it was interesting engaging and people loved it and left and of course uh we released it on dvd and then he got a le- sent a legal letter and said we weren't allowed to put it on dvd and <laughs> and so you are a dick <laughs> re- reminding everybody that he's the ultimate warrior still at the end of the fucking day um even even though he was fine with it and fine with cameras being around and it being recorded and even though people were putting it up on youtube for free later than night he didn't want anybody to the guy who paid him all that money to be there, he didn't want him make to profit any from money, make no. any money off of it whatsoever. So, you know, that just it's it's fucking complicated. He had very very highs where he could be a human being, but then do we really know if that's the real person? It's it's complex. It's to say the fucking least. It is fucking complex. And maybe to lighten this whole segment from me, I maybe I'll tell you um the one thing that uh, I got out of my little short interview with George South that I do for a lot of these podcasts. Um, The one thing that I took away the most out of the entire interview, and I wanted to say it for final thoughts, is when I I asked George uh, about the Ultimate Warrior, if there's anything more he wanted to say before I let George go. And George was like, yeah, one more thing. I think the most impressive thing about the Ultimate Warrior is, is those armbands. Because he used to get them so tight, and George would be so impressed how tight he would get them <laughs> that they were they're unbelievably tight, and they just did it just to pump up his bicep to look even bigger. But George was like, he would take his teeth and like pull on one of them, like pull it as tight as he possibly could. Like I don't know how one man could get those arm pads that tight. But that's I'll leave it with a with a joke as opposed to any more any more praise. WWE is giving him more than enough of that. Ultimate Warrior is the worst wrestler ever (laughs) to reach the heights that he did. And that sounds bad, but what I think I'm trying to say is it really shows how important a character and a gimmick can be in pro wrestling. If you can just make the people love you, 
you don't need a five star match. You don't need Canadian destroyers. When when you're over, you're you're over. As a kid, I loved him. As a teen, I was kind of over it. You know, I was moving into the rock and Stone Cold and stuff. But then as an adult, you know, I started appreciating, I think, ring work a little more. And, and while I respected his run, I, I didn't quite care for him so much anymore. Then after hearing about how he used his platform to further disfranchise groups that are hurting in this country, fuck him. You know, the, I don't think the world is missing anything with him being gone. But he was larger than life. He is a tremendously important figure in pro wrestling. So, you know, I don't support the Warrior as a person, but as a pro wrestler, one of the most important of all time. I have a really fucking hard time with Warrior now. Like I said, I'm wearing a shirt, but then I also angrily fucking ripped into him because he clearly shows that he's just what he called Heenan, a two-faced bag of shit. Warrior is interesting from just a history standpoint of wrestling. I mean, even when it comes to Hogan, man, the amount of losses he had when he was in his time, the only clean loss, clean loss he had was against Andre in close to Grenoble, France, which if you know Andre, it's fucking Grenoble, France. Uh, He had a loss to Dino Bravo, but that was like in Montreal. So that kind of shows a little like, all right, he wasn't against giving a little shine to the dude that was near the people that loved him uh savage had some stuff but it's one of those like even when you talk about hogan clean losses on message boards even warriors are even harder and like i brought up like hogan didn't even get a clean victory over warrior when he beat him for any weird completist there's a weird uh arsenio hall interview before the wrestlemania where he acts like warrior and he turns stuff over and he realized he shit the bed and then he does regis and kathy lee before a rick root before the rick root cage match and he's just a human being he's jim helwig and he talks and you want to like him and then he kind of and then regis kind of pushes him into destroying the set because regis is like why are you so docile why are you so not a professional wrestler and then warrior just kind of goes and it's this really cool little bit and it's those fucking moments that you want to like him and it hurts even on uh the self-destruction like you see chris jericho edge christian you can see still the they both really appreciate it and there is some stuff to put him over and then you see all the stupid shit that he did with his blog and he lost his fucking mind and it's it's i think he 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 did bodybuilding he got into pro wrestling and then once he his ego was so fucking overblown and he was so full of what he could accomplish and somehow that mixed with be your own true self but you know fuck all these people and you're better off without your queer dad and all this stuff and it's just it's the balancing act of that I don't understand how he fucking dealt with it and it really it fucking hurts and like Jake Jake mentioned, the meet and greets, if you, you can look up videos on YouTube of the meet and greets that the Ultimate Warrior does, there's a, there's a really awkward one where this dude in full warrior garb and face paint cuts a 60-second warrior promo right in front of Warrior. And it's one of those things where you're just cringing the whole time. And you're like, oh, God, make it stop. And the whole time, Warrior is smiling, and he's digging it. And then they have a conversation And there's other ones where Warrior's just the most personable dude to his fans. And I've heard tons of stories on message boards of the research I did where Warrior would just talk to every fan. And it's it's one of those things where it's just like, oh, you're a fucking social justice warrior. Fuck that. If, if, you know, a a gay fan came up to him and just said, you know, oh, do you fucking hate me? It's one of those things where I would just love to be there. And I think Warrior just got sucked in by ideology and early exposure to certain books and certain thinking. And he didn't understand the scope of all people and how shit works. And he just kind of turned into a fucking gigantic piece of shit. And I say he's a gigantic piece of shit with the thinking that growing up, he was seriously my number one. Like, my favorite memories of early wrestling. I used to go to school at a a Battleground Elementary. My mom taught right next to me, so it was me and my mom in the same school. And sometimes she would have like two hour fucking meetings after school. And she would surprise rent Royal Rumbles or WrestleManias or Survivor Series for me. And one of the early ones I remember is fucking WrestleMania 6. And she had the fucking rollout TV VCR 
teacher combo that I know everyone listening to this knows what the fuck that means. Like, woo, free day. And she would have that, and she would leave a note on the door when I expected to see her. And I was like, oh, shit, my mom's not here. But then I get to fucking watch WrestleMania six, and then learn that the fucking Ultimate Warrior, my favorite dude who shook the ropes and just was my true comic book hero. I had his wrestling buddy, and I got to sit in that room by myself and watch Ultimate Warrior pin Hulk Hogan in one of the most epic matches I'd ever seen at the fucking time. And what that meant to me at the age of fucking 10 or 11 fucking hurts to what he turned into. Because I just think he was lost. He was kind of a bag of shit, but he's one of those bags of shit that you just know. Maybe if he had the right guidance, something would have worked out. But I don't fucking know. All right. That is our episode on The Ultimate Warrior. Thanks for listening. Um, If you want to support our show, uh, leave us a rating and a review. That's easy. That's free. Uh, If you want to throw a little money our way, we're on Patreon, where you can get a Tim Bell Pod shirt, some bonus content. You can even pick who we cover in a future episode at patreon.com slash Tim Bell Pod. Find us on the World Wide Web at TimBellPod.com, on social media at Tim Bell Pod. I am Nicolessa on the social medias. Jake is Man Scout Manning on all the social medias. And Micah is jtrotter27 on Twitter. Dun, 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 dun. None of us can do Hold on. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. I am a real American. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to the 10 Bell Pod. This is the Man Scout, Jake Manning, letting you know if you really want to support the pod, why don't you support us on Patreon? And it's very simple to do. Just log on to patreon.com forward slash and or backslash. Uh, We don't know how slashes work. Uh, We live in a digital age, and you can just Google everything. And actually, you know, while you're all in there Googling uh, 10 Bell Pod on Patreon, why don't you Google... uh, What's the difference between a backslash and a front slash? So while you're there and you figure that mess out, make sure you log on to patreon.com forward slash and or backslash 10 bell pod.